Instead, I want to say something about how Hegel's social linguistic development of Kant's fundamental insight into the essentially normative character of our mindedness provides a model of positive freedom. One of the central issues of classical political philosophy is how to reconcile individual freedom with constraint by social, communal, or political norms. Kant's vision of us as rational creatures opens up a space for an understanding of a kind of freedom that consists in being able to constrain ourselves by norms. Indeed, by norms that are rational, in the sense that they're conceptual norms, norms that articulate what's a reason for what. The normative conception of positive freedom then makes possible a distinctive kind of answer to the question of how the loss of individual negative freedom, freedom from constraint, that's inevitably involved in being subject to institutional norms could be rationally justified from the point of view of the individual. In the Kantian context, such a justification could in principle consist in a corresponding increase in positive freedom. The positive expressive freedom, the freedom to do something, that's obtainable only by constraining oneself by the conceptual norms implicit in discursive social practices, in speaking a public language, is a central case where such a justification evidently is available. Speaking a particular language requires complying with a daunting variety of norms, rules, and standards, and the result of failure to comply with enough of them is unintelligibility. That fact can recede so far into the background as to be well nigh invisible for our home languages, but it's an obtrusive, unpleasant, and unavoidable feature of working in a language in which one is not, in that sense, at home. And the same phenomenon is manifest in texts that intentionally violate even a relatively small number of central grammatical and semantic norms. You might think of Gertrude Stein's prose here. But the kind of positive freedom that one gets in return for constraining oneself in these multifarious ways is distinctive and remarkable. The astonishing empirical observation with which Chomsky inaugurated contemporary linguistic theory is that almost every sentence uttered by an adult native speaker is radically novel. That is, not only has that speaker never heard or uttered just that sequence of words before, but neither has anyone else, ever. Have a nice day may get a lot of play in the States, noch eins in Germany, and gadai here, but any tolerably complex sentence is almost bound to be new. Quotation aside, it is, for instance, exceptionally unlikely that anyone else has ever used a sentence chosen at random from the story I've been telling. And that's not a special property just of professor speak. Surveys of large corpora of actual utterances, collected and collated by indefatigable graduate students, have repeatedly confirmed this empirically. And it can be demonstrated on more fundamental grounds by looking at the number of sentences of, say, 30 words or less, that even a relatively simple grammar can construct using the extremely minimal 5,000 word vocabulary of basic English. Your vocabulary is more like 50,000 words. There just hasn't been time in human history for us to have used a substantial proportion of those sentences, even if every human being there had been had spoken English and did nothing but chatter incessantly. Yet I have no trouble producing, and you have no trouble understanding, a sentence that in spite of its ordinariness, it's quite unlikely that anyone else has ever happened to use before, such as, we shouldn't leave for the picnic until we've, we're sure that we've packed my old wool blanket, the thermos, and all the sandwiches we made this morning. This capacity for radical semantic novelty fundamentally distinguishes sapient creatures from those who do not engage in linguistic practices. Because of it, we can, and do all the time, make claims, formulate desires, and entertain goals that no one in the history of the world has ever before so much as considered. This massive positive expressive freedom transforms the lives of sentient creatures who become sapient by constraining themselves by linguistic, which is to say conceptual norms. So in the conceptual normativity implicit in linguistic practice, we have a model of a kind of constraint, a loss of negative freedom, that's repaid many times over in a bonanza of positive freedom. Anyone who is in a position to consider the trade-off rationally would consider it a once-in-a-lifetime bargain. Of course, one need not be a creature like us. As Sellers says, one could always simply not speak, but only at the cost of having nothing to say. And non-sapient sentience are, after all, hardly in a position to weigh the pros and cons involved. 
But the fact remains there is an argument that shows that at least this sort of normative constraint is rational from the point of view of the individual. That it pays off by opening up a dimension of positive freedom that's a pearl without price, available in no other way. Hegel's idea is that this case provides the model that every other social or political institution that proposes to constrain our negative freedom should be compared to and measured against. The question for him always is, what new kind of expressive freedom? What new kinds of life possibilities? What new kinds of commitment, responsibility, and authority are made possible by this institution? His strategy is to use an understanding of the basic metaphysical structure of mind, meaning, and rationality as the basis for normative assessment of lives and institutions. Now, I said a while back that it may seem that I was dragging the notion of freedom in, kicking and screaming into a, uh, a semantic and pragmatic discussion. I hope it doesn't seem like that now. But I want to close by mentioning a topic that initially, no doubt, seems still further removed, <coughs> at least from issues of personal autonomy and political freedom, if not from semantics, namely alethic modality. Kant read Hume's practical and theoretical philosophies as raising variants on a single question. On the side of practical reasoning, Hume asks what our warrant is for moving from descriptions of how things are to prescriptions of how they ought to be. How can we rationally justify the move from is to ought? On the side of theoretical reasoning, Hume asks what our warrant is for moving from descriptions of what in fact happens to characterizations of what must happen and what could not happen. How can we rationally justify the move from descriptions of matter of factual regularities to formulations of necessary laws? In Kant's terminology, these are both species of necessity, moral or practical on the one hand, and natural necessity respectively. For Kant, necessary, notwendig, just means according to a rule. Hume's predicament, in Kant's term, is that he finds that even his best understanding of facts doesn't yield an understanding of rules governing and relating those facts, underwriting assessments of which of the things that actually happen, something we can experience, ought to happen, that is, are normatively necessary, or must happen, are modally or naturally necessary. Kant's response, in a nutshell, is that Hume's predicament is not a real one. It's the product of a confusion. One cannot, in fact, fully understand the descriptive empirical employment of ordinary determinate concepts, say cat, without at least implicitly understanding also what's made explicit by the modal concepts that articulate laws. Hume thinks he can understand what it is to say the cat is on the mat without understanding what it means to say that it's possible for the cat to be elsewhere, but necessary that it not be larger than the earth. <coughs> Kant's claim, put in contemporary terms, is that part of what one's committed to in applying any determinate concept in empirical circumstances is a distinction between counterfactual differences in circumstances that would and those that would not affect the truth of the judgment one is making. It would still be true that the cat is on the mat if the lighting were subtly different, but it wouldn't be true that the cat is on the mat if the force of gravity were two orders of magnitude stronger than it in fact is. And if you don't understand that, you don't grasp the concept cat. Hume frames his question as an epistemological one concerning the justification of our claims to know what must happen or what ought to happen based on our experience of what in fact does happen. Once again, Kant offers both a semantic diagnosis of the origins of this epistemological predicament that makes this question seem urgent and difficult. And once again, he offers a semantic response that if successful, diffuses the epistemological worry. Sellers summarizes this Kantian thought in the title of one of his essays, Concepts as Involving Laws and Inconceivable Without Them. It's a very long essay, and unfortunately, that's the last intelligible sentence in the essay, but it's a wonderful title. A corresponding line of thought is to be mounted on the side of normative or practical necessity. Normative concepts make explicit commitments that are implicit in the practice of acting intentionally in the exercise, exercise of practical agency itself. Intentional agency is a thoroughly normative phenomenon because it too consists in the application of concepts and applying concepts is undertaking commitments and responsibilities whose content is articulated by those concepts. For Kant, specifically moral normative vocabulary makes explicit commitments that are already implicit in the practical use of any concepts 
to endorse Maxim's ends or plans. My point is that Kant's response to Hume's predicament, his account of the nature and expressive role of modal and normative, as he calls them, pure concepts, is not in fact as far removed from his discussion of the nature of freedom as might at first have appeared. Both are rooted in and developments of his normative turn, his fundamental reconstrual of mind, meaning, and rationality in normative terms. Now, my aim in this talk has been to convey what in my title I called some Kantian lessons about what it is to have a mind, to grasp and apply meanings, to be rational. What I've been doing, you'll notice, is not really Kant exegesis. I haven't been concerned to interpret particular bits of his text so as to catch him expressing the views I've been attributing to him. That's an important and a necessary task, and in its absence I can at most claim to have been expounding Kantian lessons, not Kant's own theory. My characterization of Kant's largest ideas and their relations to one another deserves to be controversial, arguably tendentious. But I think that in thinking about Kant's grandest philosophical contributions, there's a standing danger of losing sight of the forest by focusing on the trees. And the cost of succumbing to that danger is to fail to appreciate why Kant is worth reading, why he's so important, the conceptual sea change that he ushers in, the radically new constellation of philosophical ideas that he put in play. Again, I think we've only really just begun the process of digesting those ideas. Though the thought sometimes tempts me, I won't in fact claim that Kant tells us nearly everything we need to know about mind's concepts and their use and contents. But what he does tell us is so deep and significant and ramifies into and reverberates through so many neighboring theoretical domains that I think it does deserve to be thought of as the most, dis most important distinctively philosophical contribution to the multidisciplinary study of mind, meaning, and rationality. And I've tried to say something today about why I think Kant is and should remain for philosophers what the sea was for the poet Swinburne, the great gray mother of us all. putting our hands up at this stage. What we're going to do now is move straight on to some comments on um, the paper by day, and then we'll have a discussion after that. Analytic philosophy through much of its history has been conducted as if there were a sharp dis distinction between the history of philosophy and an active engagement in the problems of philosophy. It is as though analytic philosophy took over the manner of thinking represented by the figure of Descartes' meditator, as if all that were required to engage the deepest problems of metaphysics and epistemology, say, were a comfortable armchair and several hours of free time. Another motivation, of course, is the tendency within analytic philosophy to assimilate the activities of philosophy as closely as possible to those of the scientist. And of course, one can do good work in the sciences without knowing anything about the history of science. This situation has changed in recent years, and many analytic philosophers now do take the history of philosophy, including the history of analytic philosophy, seriously. But in spite of that, it is still commonplace to hear some variant of the view that draws a line between a concern with the problems themselves and a concern with the thoughts of historical figures whose problems it is supposed are past their use-by date. Professor Brandon may not be the first analytic philosopher to, re to reject this way of thinking about philosophy and its past. The broadly Hegelian view that philosophy is not to be distinguished from the history of philosophy is evident in the writings of Charles Taylor, John Rawls, Richard Rorty, Bernard Williams, amongst others. But what strikes me as of particular interest is Brandon's capacity to deliver on philosophy's old promise to, th to see things radically anew especially when the object of study is well-trodden terrain, as in this case. As this strikingly original essay on Kant makes clear, Brandon does not rest content with merely blurring the distinction between exegesis and argument. Rather, he makes a bold and new move in the activity of what might be called creative reappropriation of historical texts. And this work forms an indispensable aspect of Brandon's exciting project of leading analytic philosophy towards those very philosophers it, be it began by disowning, Kant and Hegel. 
Strawson's reading of Kant in the bounds of sense made an important step in this direction by de-emphasizing Kant's transcendental idealism, his transcendental deduction of the categories and the claim of, of synthetic a priori status to the possibilities of Newtonian physics and Euclidean geometry. Instead of highlighting these highly controversial, some would say implausible aspects of Kant's thinking, Strawson treated Kant as offering an account of the metaphysics of experience, one that is not only believable, but which offers important insights that might be missed in the blanket rejection of Kant's more questionable doctrines. Brandom's reading of Kant makes a significant advance along this path by moving the focus from the topic of experience to the primacy of judgment of what we can be responsible for, and so to the normative characterization of mind, meaning, and rationality. Brandon's heady claim is that Kant's most important insights are only now beginning to become available to contemporary thought. At the end of his paper, Brandon denies that what he is doing is exegesis, and it seems fair to say that he is not anachronistically reading contemporary thought back into Kant either. Rather, we are offered a philosophical vision at the heart of Kant's enterprise that significantly raises the bar in terms of what we can hope for from readings in the history of philosophy. I think I can speak for everyone here in expressing my admiration for this work of philosophical imagination in full flight. Although there are a great many topics in Brandom's paper that are worthy of discussion, I would like to consider just one of the lessons Kant has taught us on Brandom's reading, namely Kant's transformation of epistemological problems into semantic ones, or more specifically, the idea of a semantic response to philosophical scepticism. Without going into the details of Kant's transcendental argument, Brandon claims that Kant's insight is to see that Cartesian scepticism rests on a false semantics, the doctrine of autonomous content. In raising the question of how his representations as of an external world can be justified, the skeptic makes a crucial semantic assumption. He presupposes that it is possible to entertain contentful thoughts about how things globally seem without making any commitments about how things actually are. The question of what is required for the possibility of representation at all, whether successful or not, is conceptually prior to the question of what is required to explain or justify when it is successful. The Kantian moral is, as Brandon puts it, quote, unless we are to a large extent right about how things are, we can't make we can't make sense even of our being wrong in special cases about how things are. We are further invited to see this basic semantic response to, to an epistemological problem mobilized in, in Davidson's transcendental argument from interpretation theory that most of our beliefs must be true and in Putnam's conclusion that I cannot say or think that I am all, an always invatted brain in a vat. Very roughly, the Kantian strategy offers a transcendental argument of the form if we have contentful thoughts at all, then some of them must be correct. But is this argument plausible? Kant's actual filling out of this argument in the refutation of idealism requires the questionable premise that something permanent or relatively permanent cannot be found in the contents of one's own mind. This being required as a condition of there being consciousness of oneself as determined in time. Davidson's argument rests on the questionable assumption that making best sense of someone excludes attributing systematic but explicable error to them. And Putnam's brain of that argument relies on causal constraints on reference that the skeptic will want to call into question. And in any case, the argument has no force against recent envapment skeptical scenarios. We might also recall Stroud's well-known criticism of the anti-skeptical force of transcendental arguments, in, the, in his case, those of Strawson and Shoemaker. Stroud argued that at best, these arguments demonstrate what we must believe. But of course, there is a gap between the conclusion about what we must believe and the claims about what actually exists that the skeptic doubts. In order to bridge the gap, Stroud continued, these arguments require a verification principle to the, to the effect that, we are meaningfully to, that if we are to meaningfully to engage in the practice of belief formation with respect to a kind of object, then it must be possible to verify that objects of that kind exist. In Kant's own case, it is not a verification principle, but his transcendental idealism that bridges the gap between what is necessarily thought and empirical reality. 
No doubt it is in light of these problems for the semantic strategy that Brandon is careful not to claim that, he, that this Kantian anti-skeptical response actually works. So let us ask what Brandon supposes is Kant's attitude to scepticism, supposing for the sake of argument that it does work. Kant is read as proving, providing, a semantic argument from the conditions of representation to a conclusion that resolves or answers scepticism. That is, Kant is supposed to think that scepticism can be laid to rest once and for all on the basis of an insight into the semantic underpinnings of epistemology. And this certainly fits Kant's talk of refutation and of giving a proof that lays what he calls the scandal of scepticism to rest. However, I have my doubts that the, scan the Kantian semantic strategy, deep and important though it no doubt is, provides a complete account of Kant's conception of scepticism or of the threat that it poses. In the following remarks, I shall do no more than hint at what a more complete account might look like. In the introduction to the Critique of Pure Reason, Kant takes over the ancient Greek conception of scepticism as standing opposed to the dogmatism, the dogmatic appointment of reason. Scepticism opposes dogmatism by exposing our aspiration to rationally justify our claims by good enough reasons as pretense. In situations in which dogmatic assertions are made or dogmatic assertions stand opposed to each other, the skeptic advises us not to take a stand since reason does not decide what to think. This leads, a skeptic, this leads to a skeptical suspension of judgment on the matter. Now in Kant's terms, dogmatism is a symptom of reason in its infancy, and skepticism is an insight into the limitations of this misemployment of reason. One that helps to motivate a thoroughgoing critique of reason, that is, an investigation of reason's legitimate employment, including an examination of its limits. As Kant puts it, Scepticism is thus a resting place for human reason, where it can reflect upon its dogmatic wanderings and make survey of the region in which it finds itself, so that for the future it may be able to choose its path with more certainty, but it is no dwelling place for permanent settlement. In order to understand passages such as this, one needs a distinction, I think, between scepticism as a general syndrome and scepticism as a particular kind of problem, i.e external world scepticism, other mind scepticism, inductive scepticism, and so on. So even if Kant has, has provided an answer or refutation of external world scepticism, which as we have seen is questionable, that still leaves open the possibility that there is no such overcoming of scepticism understood in general terms as a certain self-defeating employment of reason. As I hope to show, this, as I hope to, sh oh sorry, as I hope to show, this dwelling place of scepticism is one of the permanent options available in our employment of reason, even though, as Kant points out, it is not, as we might put it, livable. In order to explore this possibility further, I want to return to one of the central points in Brandom's paper, the deontic conception of judgment as something that we can be responsible for. I want to extend this treatment of judgment to scepticism itself. If judgment is a matter of taking responsibility for a claim, then I want to suggest scepticism can be thought of as a matter of disowning or a failure to acknowledge our doxastic responsibilities. What is ultimately at stake in scepticism then is our entitlement to believe, or in other words, what we can be held responsible for in the sense of being properly subject to criticism for endorsing. And the sceptic, I want to claim, is the one who denies that we have such responsibilities or avoid such responsibilities. In broad terms, the sceptic is a rationalist, asking what reason we have to accept a range of basic beliefs that seem to be presupposed by our system of belief. Like the rationalist, the sceptic comes to think that in order to earn one's entitlement to these basic beliefs, one must have appropriate reasons. But the, lessons, the lesson of our engagement in sceptical reasoning, as I'm sure you'll all attest, is that there, are, that there are beliefs that we must accept and take responsibility for, even though we can find no independent reason to accept them. That is, we can find no reason that does not already presuppose them. And the belief in the existence of the external world, I would argue, is one belief like that. The sceptic in coming to the disappointing conclusion that we have no independent reason for such beliefs comes to disown them. The conclusion is properly seen not as a form of negative dogmatism, that is, say, claiming that we, do, that we ought not to believe or that we do not know, 
but a suspension of judgment, a lack of commitment, a disavowal of responsibility. The skeptic pursues the demand for reasons to the point that we encounter groundless beliefs to which we see that we are committed. Unless we can retain our confidence in such beliefs, our entire system of beliefs is vulnerable. But Kant's conception that reason must be free to criticise itself must inevitably leave this sceptical possibility open. This is one reason, I think, Kant's semantic response to Cartesian scepticism notwithstanding, that scepticism as a general syndrome might be fruitfully compared to what Kant calls dialectical illusion, which consists in reason's illegitimate claim to know beyond the limits of experience. Both are illusions of reason, examples of reason coming into conflict with itself, but springing from the very nature of reason itself. That Kant shares something like this deontic conception of scepticism and the sense of scepticism as a permanent possibility of human reason is suggested by his own jur juridical methodology in the first critique. The point is wider than the familiar claim that deduction, as Kant uses it, refers not to a logical proof, but a legal deduction which aims to justify an acquired title or claim of right by tracing it back to its origins. In particular, reason, in its critical employment, is pictured as a legal tribunal that must defend its claims against sceptical attack. The aim is to show that we are responsible for them by showing how they hang together in a coherent and comprehensive system that includes basic beliefs, such as that we have the faculty of sensibility and the faculty of understanding and they're different, um, as well as various principles and interests of reason, such as its metaphysical aspirations. At the end of Brandon's paper, we are told that Hegel's principal innovation over Kant is the recognition that normative statuses are social statuses. A crucial part of this story is that we, that we acknowledge each other's authority. But at least with respect to reason, Kant already has a social or public conception in which everybody is accorded equal status in their capacity to speak in the name of reason, as he explains. So this is Kant again. Reason must in all its undertakings subject itself to criticism. Should it limit freedom to criticism by any prohibitions, it must harm itself, drawing upon itself a damaging suspicion. Nothing is so important through its usefulness, nothing so sacred, that it may be exempted from this searching examination, which knows no respect for persons. For reason has no dictatorial authority. Its verdict is always simply the agreement of free citizens, of whom each one must be permitted to express without let or hindrance, his objections and even his veto. It is the nature of a legal action brought before a court that one's opponent must be allowed to have his say. On this conception, far from resolving or answering scepticism once and for all, the best we can do is resolve or answer particular sceptical challenges to reason one at a time. Understanding the sceptical problem on the deontic conception, then, becomes a matter of understanding the ways in which we avoid the responsibilities that inevitably come with being a rational agent in the world. And as we know, nothing is more human than the human ten tendency to disown or avoid its responsibilities. Thank you. Dave, uh, Bob, do you just a word? Yeah. Thank you for that. I uh, take the correction about the skepticism. I think that's a wonderful story. I uh, uh, endorse uh, all of that, uh, uh, including the part that I just learned. <laughs> uh, uh, and I, I'm not going to defend the uh, semantic arguments against uh, epistemological skepticism. You say there's a reason that I held that at arm's length. I, I, I do want to say that it seems to be the advice to look to the semantic presuppositions of epistemological problems uh, remains. And we can see that better if we try sort of less heaven-storming arguments yeah. than the uh, uh, Davidsonian charity or the uh, brains in vats. Uh, I've for many years had a, a debate with my friend Alvin Goldman uh, on this point. W one of his real innovations in epistemology, of course, was realizing that uh, knowledge attributions do not always require justification, as the uh, classical JTB account had suggested. 
that uh, in many cases, if the belief is the result of a reliable belief forming mechanism, uh, that can uh, serve the function that a justification had served uh, before. Uh, Goldman was inclined to draw very radical conclusions from this epistemological reliabilism, saying, look, in epistemology, uh, the general notion is that of a reliable belief forming mechanism and its products. Justification only matters in that it's a more or less reliable belief forming mechanism. It's you know, a minor special case here. Let's just think about reliability. In epistemology, uh, I don't have much in the way uh, to object to that. But he's taking for granted the contents of the beliefs. If inferentialism is right, you can't make sense of those contents except by looking at their inferential relations to one another. Justification is uh, of principal importance already at the semantic level. You can't sweep it away in favor of uh, reliable connections uh, among beliefs, not because of the epistemology, but because of the semantics. And when I say this to he says, well, I sure hope it's not true, but I'm an epistemologist, not a semantic theorist. That's not my department. And I say, well, you know, you got to worry about it whether it's your department uh, or not. That, that's an example where I think the ultimately Kantian advice to look to the semantic presuppositions of epistemological uh, programs, that, that's a sort of uh, commoner garden variety instance with, without the, the grand aspirations. And, and that I still think you know, we should say, yeah, Kant taught us that and we should keep that heuristic in mind. Good, okay, well we'll now open the floor for questions. We've got about 15 minutes or so, and then we'll have a short break while we set up the um, interview room. You're right. So I'm not very happy with the primacy of the, the positional of that, of the um, intentionality over non-propositional or off intentionality. And it's, my reason has sort of two parts. The first is, so you look at uh, that clauses. The content specification that comes afterwards is always via a sentence, right? Whereas with uh, off clauses, the content specification will be via a singular term. Now, it's interesting that for every sentence you can generate via a nominalization, you can generate a singular term, but you can't do it the other way around. So with the sentence, the weather is nice, you can always have the nominal, the weather's niceness, or the weather's being nice. These are singular terms. And if, if you can plug the sentence into a that clause, you can plug the, uh, the nominal into an off clause. But you couldn't do the, off, the other way around. Now, so um, the second part is this. If you compare the report, I think that the weather is nice with the report. I think of the weather's niceness. In, uh, in the first case, you have that intentionality. In the second case, you have both intentionality. And it seems to me that the second case is logically prior because you could say something like, I think of the weather's niceness, but I don't think that the weather is nice. That sounds like an okay sentence. But to say something like, I think that the weather is nice, but I don't think of the weather's niceness, that sounds like a contradiction. And that suggests that um, thinking of the weather's niceness is somehow logically prior to thinking that the weather is nice. And more generally, that office intentionality is some kind of primacy to that intentionality. Well, that's a very interesting, uh, a very interesting argument. Uh, I mean, I think thinking of some object is just thinking that something or other is true uh, of the object. So I, I think that the primacy, you know, even in that case, goes from from the that to the of. Um, um, but that's not something you can just say. That, is, that I can just say. Uh, giving cash for that requires showing how to go from a notion of sentential content to saying what singular terms are. Uh, Frege says that uh, you can only make sense of what, you can only understand what singular terms are by thinking of the contribution they make to something that can have uh, a truth value. And then he goes on to, to show us sort of what that contribution is. His function argument analysis is basically a substitutional one. He's got a notion of 
conceptual content, you know, starting with uh, sentences, since two things have the same conceptual content, if when combined with the same other premises, they have the same consequences. So we've got an inferential role picture in the McGriff script. And then to get to singular terms, we look at substitution inferences uh, involving the ones that are made explicit by uh, whose explicit uh, uh, inference licenses are identity claims. And I, you know, I think a full-blown story <coughs> can be told like that. Uh, I try to do that in chapter six of uh, making it explicit. But I think you know, there's a job of work to be done there to show that it's so much as intelligible that you should treat sentences as prior to uh, singular terms. I also think, uh, so anyway, that's the grounds on which I think you know, it ought to be argued, can, can you go the one way, can you go the other? Look, the tradition, the model theoretic tradition has shown us how to go from uh, denotations associated with singular terms and extensions associated with predicates two truth conditions for you know, a surprising variety of sentences. Uh, the Kantian claim is that just as uh, in the Tractatus we've got trouble with uh, probabilistic claims and modal claims and normative claims, that building up from the representation, we're going to have a problem uh, getting all the kinds of judgments and claims that we've got. Whereas if we start from the notion of what you're committing yourself to and um, that kind of sentence being articulated by its role in reasoning, we're going to be able to understand probabilistic claims, claims about future contingents, and so on. Again, you can't just say that. You, you've got to make that case happen. Uh, I think that it's very interesting uh, that what we need to do in a specific case of using a sentence nominalization in de re position, in, in the of position, in order to get a sentence, is to say something like, uh, Senator Joe McCarthy, the famous anti-communist, believed of the first sentence of the Communist Manifesto that it was true. You've got to use you know, a disquotational uh, expression in, uh, in that clause. And I think that's a reflection of the privacy and the order of explanation of the proposition. But I mean, my mission in life is not to get people sort of to believe this and be inferentialists is to work out this sort of explanation to something approximating <coughs> the level of sophistication which the representationalists from the low order of explanation has been given in the 20th century. Because so far, it's an unequal context. That, you know, that one, we know how to make work, at least for a whole lot of things. This other one is the new kid. Melissa. Oh, yeah. Um, I think this is my follow-up from what Dad was saying um, in relation to the Kantian commitment can't be separated from our responsibility to a community of, um, in transcendental terms, community of rational beings, in empirical terms, you know, uh, it works on both levels, but he does have those two levels, and I think that's what Kant, uh, that's what Hegel criticizes in Kant, and then sort of tries to collapse those two into one, but I think the problem there is that once you collapse those two, you no longer have that distance between the law and my assent to the law that makes my assent to the law or my conforming to the law meaningful and an expression of my positive freedom. Um, so I think that's that's where the problem for Hegel comes back in. Uh, and the, way, the, example, sorry, the example of language, I think, makes that clear, that you don't have the same freedom in relation to those who do to the law, for example. Good. Um, I mean, I think it's a nice question exactly what role the community of other rational beings plays in Kant. The, the Hegelian picture is it comes in too late. You know, it, it, it's not constitutive of uh, the existence of commitment of your being bound by a norm. It comes in later when we're talking about systemization and so on. That may or may not be uh, be fair. As, as I say, I, I think that's uh, I think that's controversial. But as to the question of whether once um, uh, Hegel has collapsed the levels at which these things are instituted and applied, so he's seeing, you know, I think, uh, it, on this particular issue, that Hegel is to Kant, his client is to Carnap, the Carnap had separated sort of meanings from our commitment, you know, our applications of things in endorsing a theory. And Klein comes along and says, look, there's just one thing. We just talk. And we've got to understand that as both the application of, I'm going to talk about application of 
concepts that uh, we can put those words in as well, as both the application of concepts and as the institution of the conceptual norms. We've got to somehow see those as phases of one process. And, and I think he Hegel is doing that and pushing together those elements <coughs> that Kant tries to keep apart. Does he get them pushed too far together there? For him, it's a difference between what you're implicitly committed to just by talking and your explicit acknowledgement uh, of that commitment. And that difference between that transition from an implicit commitment to an explicitly acknowledged commitment, that's the essence of his expressivism, is to say, uh, you know, that's what we do, is become aware of ourselves by explicitly acknowledging things that it turns out we were already implicitly acknowledged to, uh, uh, committed to at the highest moral level to treating each other in various ways as we see that uh, social substance is synthesized by reciprocal recognition and so um, we're obliged to recognize other people just by our having determined the content for thoughts and more uh, down to earth in, you know, in making a certain commitment, undertaking a certain commitment with all kinds of implicit things in it and being aware of what I've really done is making those explicit to me. So I think structurally that his notion of expression as making the implicit explicit is you know, Hegel's attempt not to have that collapse have the disastrous result that you're pointing to. But um, you know, th this is exactly the, the structural issue in, in getting from Kant's picture to Hegel's picture in this vicinity that, that we ought to worry about. And that I mean, we ought to worry about not just for Kant and Hegel, but how are we going to think about uh, commitments and responsibilities. And here I think uh, the Kantian one I can't uh, sort of make work today. <clears throat> the Hegelian one, it seems to me, has yes, it's a, you know, I think it's the later Wittgenstein that made these things visible to us again. The normative character of intentionality, <clears throat> the social character of that. And I think that, the American pragmatism doing that too, but that's the way forward. Whether it's going to have exactly this Hegelian structure that's exactly the issue. Peter. Uh, yes, you, you um, quote with approval the uh, Kant and Frederick point that the concepts are the answer in terms of the role of judgments, or as a part of course, discourse. Uh, just thinking, uh, that seems to be quite important to the framework that strikes me as being rather restrictive. Uh, there's a different kind of discourse, a different kind of thinking, uh, which is also important to content. Uh, or, or to determine content from that sort of supposition. Think um, children, they say, let's imagine that uh, there are two children, there are two Indians behind the bush, or some mathematicians might do supposition or use in uh, the context of the ducking art. Suppose the square root of two is rational and so on. That seems to me that form of reasoning, that kind of discourse is very crucial to determining content. And that's actually okay. the, the thing that's pointed out by the uh, Freire Nietzsche point that anything which, determined, which appears in the antecedent of a conditional uh, must play a role in determining content. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a link between conditional reasoning and supposition reasoning. So yeah. the same point would be caught. Anything that appears in a kind of supposition proposition must play a role in determining Okay. I, I mean, let me say, uh, first of all, that, you know, the way I put this was more restrictive than my view. I mean, I certainly think that rather practical reasoning, for instance, you know, contributes to conceptual, to, to conceptual content. This, and I'm not hostile to the idea that suppositional reasoning ought to go in there. On the other hand, my null hypothesis, as it were, uh, is that we ought to be Freudian about this. And Frege's view was that uh, entertaining a proposition, for instance, for the purpose of extracting or exploring consequences of it and so on, always is a matter of embedding it as the antecedent of the conditional. That is, that supposing something is uh, a way of talking about asserting conditions. And you know, I don't know whether in the end that's an adequate account of suppositional uh, reasoning. But, but, but clearly the order of explanation he's working with is one where we've got inferential relations typically you know, among asserted elements in the case of claim that we couldn't draw consequences from things we didn't take to be true. The way he said we do instead is assert conditions as take them to be true. But his picture clearly is that we do reasoning with 
uh, unvetted sentences and then reflect those inferential commitments by asserting conditionals. And that our talk about merely supposing something is disguised talk about asserting conditionals when it is the exist. So, so that, that's at least a program for you know, uh, keeping the assertion and inference picture and bringing in you know, the importance of supposition, but it's, all, it's going to be a matter of asserting conditionals. And you know, reductive proof doesn't yeah. understand. It. Just a quick remark in response, it seems to me that would be a reflection of the uh, particular kind of uh, sort of reason that Freud and Kant to recognize where all the premises and conclusion are asserted. They didn't actually sort of recognize natural deduction systems. That came in much later than a few. So like my yeah, suspicion is that that's a reflection of their kind of limited views of logic. Okay, that, I mean, that might well be right. There's a delicate issue in the vicinity, which is that uh, Descartes, in the tradition he spoke for, again, I want to say took it for granted, that first one entertained propositions and could bring these contents before one's mind, and that then there was the question of plumping for some of them, you know, putting your, putting your mark uh, on them. And Kant's idea, I think it's Frege's idea, is it can't be like that. That, that for them to be contentful, you've got to have you know, commitments to, to many of them. Uh, and, and I think that's driving Frege's wanting to say, look, merely entertaining is something that comes later. Uh, it, it's a kind of assertion, assertion of conditions. Uh, but I don't think that acknowledging, say, natural deduction <coughs> techniques would require one to recoil all the way to the Cartesian picture of merely entertaining. Uh, again, uh, a paternal example, Jerry Fodor, he's still got the Cartesian picture, and you can just entertain these representations. And we do the whole semantics at that level, and later on, we talk about which ones go in the belief box. Uh, and, and I think there's problems with that. Okay, one more very quick question for this. Uh, this is a question in the history of ideas. Really. I found what you had to say about uh, Kant on positive freedom fascinating, because much of the paper. Then. I thought you claimed that uh, it, it began with Kant. I just wondered a little bit about that in terms of the notion of being linked uh, with general ability and capacity. And so on. <laughs> of course, this was a much, much discussed uh, topic uh, from Aristotle, especially on <coughs> And I thought, I can't quite put my finger on it, but I think in some medieval thinkers there is uh, uh, ad advertence to the idea of this being expressive of the notion of freedom. And it's linked with a sort of philosophical theological conception of divine freedom in uh, creating the world, that the creation of the world is an expression <coughs> of a capacity to do, uh, and so it's a sort of an act of, of uh, well, generosity or something, of, of just expressing a, a capacity. It had to be both free and not constrained, and so uh, yes, uh, yes. positive. It, well, um, yes. A point taken, and uh, thank you for it. I actually weaseled on this. And, uh, when I said it, I said that, that Kant, uh, Kant's innovation was a special conception of positive freedom, but it was a weaseling because I said before, you know, the tradition had typically, had typically understood freedom in negative terms, and then Kant gives us a special notion of positive freedom. And I should just, you know, drop the implication that, you know, it's not a special normative version that was special, but the whole idea of positive freedom. That's uh, really not accurate, as you say. So uh, I'm busted. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think the phrase free and unconstrained act of generosity is a perfect phrase to, to, to describe Bob's um, act in coming all this way uh, and taking part in both today's events and, and last night's talk. So, Bob, thanks for yet another um, wonderful talk. Well, you, you know, you saved my life from having to listen to this because I would have told this story involuntarily anyway, <laughs> just as well. <laughs>
Thank you.